All right, Zig coming in at the top 10 on the show. We have Christian Hoffman. You might know him from his solo career or from his career in Mumps with Lance Loud from American Family. Um, the Mumps were an early punk pioneer band from the CBGB punk scene that didn't get the same uh, stage light as maybe like uh, the television or Ramones, but they rocked just as hard and had an u- even more unique sound. Christian has also worked with Kid Congo Powers, Lydia Lunch, The Contortions. He's been involved in so many projects, it was hard to get a grasp on his career. But The Mumps is where he started. There's a new collection, a remastering of The Mumps work called Rock and Roll This, Rock and Roll That. The best case scenario, you've got The Mumps with their entire career and some bonus tracks that didn't make it on any other collections before that is out now on all streaming platforms. What we're going to do is we're going to listen to a tune. This is the tune called Fatal Charm off that collection. (laughs) The Mumps Fatal Charm off the collection Rock and Roll This, Rock and Roll That, Best Case Scenario, You Got The Mumps. Um, That is available now on all streaming platforms. Make sure you check it out. There's something that... These weren't studio recordings. These are remastered and really reworked to sound like studio recordings, but this is stuff they did on their own. They never got a record deal, which um, we'll hear Christian talk about later in the conversation. But there's just something so raw and energetic about these takes and, like, rad record. Highly recommended, friends. Um, All right, before we get into it, if you guys can like, rate, review, subscribe... And uh, share the podcast and any of the podcast platforms. It helps me keep talking to insightful guests and sharing their inspiration with you. Um, with that, let's get into it. Here's Christian. Okay. <laughs> and also, you mean Richard Lloyd from television? Wow. Which uh, I guess that's a that's a good that's a good segue into the in the start of this. Um, so the mumps, you guys would open up for television, right? Yeah, we are, one of our very first uh, gigs in New York was opening for television. We did play uh, at we played with Cherry Vanilla, I think, and uh, Trudy Heller's. But uh, then we uh, I was working with Richard Hell at some Cinemabilia, and also Terry York worked there, who later became the manager for television. And Richard Hell said, "I found this club where I think we can get a gig." And we walked over and saw CBGBs, and it was the, you know, at that point it was the usual four lonely drunks sitting around. But uh, it turned into a very exciting place to play, and thank God Richard Hell got us in there. Nice. Because he, he kind of, Richard Hell and Tom kind of like, at least with the television thing, got television going. And uh, those guys, didn't they build the stage, right, in, uh, in CBGBs? And there was this whole thing about that the stage was going to be by the windows, and then they put it in the back because that was a bad idea. I am not familiar with okay. that story. You have to ask someone with more expertise than I do. Uh, I, you know, what I understood was that it was country bluegrass and blues, and they had right. had live acts there before, and so the stage was already extant. And they had, like, these – you can see in some early pictures of CBGBs, they had uh, big reproductions of vintage, like, Victorian photographs of showgirls on the wall. Oh, okay. And, and so I, from my understanding, that stage already existed. But I could be completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it happened I, before. Yeah. <laughs> well, with a, with a place like that, with so many working parts into it, in so many different, you know what I mean, like, acts that came in, in, in bands and movements that kind of came from a spot that was just a spot, there's going to be different... The legend's always going to get written, right? And like, yeah. <laughs> even if it's wrong or right, ah, that's awesome. So, and and fortunately, right now, America doesn't believe in history anymore. So you can say anything you want. <laughs> right, it's all up for grabs. Ah, oh, everything's fucked. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, so let's kind of dive into when did music become an outlet for for you? When did you start uh, conveying yourself through music? Well, I, I, you know, since I am a child of the late 60s, I mean, I, w- I was a Monkees fan, so that made me a little bit younger than my brothers, and they made fun of me for liking the Monkees. But um, in, in the late 60s, uh, music was very defining for that whole generation. You were kind of judged by who you liked or who you didn't like, and everyone was out there at TG&Y or Woolworths or whatever buying the latest 45. And then uh, it was kind of like the language of communication. So everyone wanted to be in a band that I knew my brother was in a band my my uh, uh my s- sister ended up playing you know violin and mandolin and my other brother plays crazy guitar my my other brother calls dances 
and we all went off onto different paths, but everyone played something. And I played piano, and I did it really poorly, and they always told me to shut up, and that made me want to be more defiant and make it happen. So That's it. That's it. That's the drive to do it. <laughs> yeah. The Monkey's pretty punk, though. Step in Stone, that song's punk as fuck. There is nothing wrong with the Monkeys. I mean, I think that, they've, you know, The Day We Fall in Love by Davy Jones when he does a spoken word, that is a criminal embarrassment that will last forever besmirching his legend. <laughs> but um, overall, I think the Monkeys were great. Even it was a corporate construct, you know, which I even knew at the time because you were sort of conscious of that in the 60s. Yeah. I like the corporate construct. I thought Neil Diamond did better work for the monkeys than he did for himself often. So it's interesting because in that in that forethought, like a the, to write as a perspective for some people is almost easier to to write as somebody else going, and it's almost easier to show more of yourself behind a veil like that. And like uh, when you think about like a uh, the, the Wrecking Crew and Carol Kay and all those guy, all those art uh, musicians that were yeah. kind of writing these hits for these singers in a way or writing too or enhancing and um it's it, you see that now still too with like producers and stuff if you look at a a, a a Katy Perry track or a Taylor Swift track there's umpteen added artists into it and like oh uh, yeah it's it's kind of scary <laughs> right right it is and it, and there's definitely so i think like during the, like that time a lot of pop music was written like that with a committee you know, well, it, 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 you have to, you know, the over arch, over, no, overarching arc of the '60s was it was the first uh, generation where they actually wrote music for themselves. Like right. usually, a singer didn't write their own material, you know, through the '20s, '30s, '40s, and '50s. And then in the 60s, the Beatles came along and wrote their own music, and it was kind of a total shock. And then by the time we got to the 70s, there was all that dreadful confessional stuff. I admit it. I love Joni Mitchell. <laughs> but then you were so, seen as suspect if you accepted a song from another author. It was like you were talentless, and you, wouldn't, you weren't really allowed to be a song stylist or a singer for a while. And then... And, and so then, then it veered backwards, and now everything's allowable, but <laughs> right. nothing makes any sense. True, but that makes sense. So that that's the arch of it. That's when like the individual becomes uh, celebrated, as you know, and upfront about it. Like, because well, you think '60s Dylan, the Beatles, all these bands that are just them, and they're the the whole uh, writers, producers, not producers, but writer, the driving force behind it. Um, yeah. And then the confessional music came in, and at first it was kind of good because they signed really good people. But after a while, you thought, like, well, your confession isn't that interesting. <laughs> so, and, and I think, you know, punk came along and tried to upend all that stuff. But right. it really, uh, uh, punk was kind of 60s in its notion that all of those people, whether they were degraded as talentless or just rotten noise, were making their own perspective you know, and that's kind of 60s damage in itself, even though they, with all the punks, would deny it, because they were all just making their own special racket. Right, right, and well, that's that's the that's the punk attitude, right? This is what we have. Yeah. This is ourselves. This we're going full force to be us, even though like it yeah. kind of became like a a cliche and 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 became like a a genre with a t-shirt you wear to partake in it. In a, in a style yeah, it was of codified towards the end, and right. in many some regions, it'd be like it. it at the beginning, at least in my experience of it in New York, was it was all encompassing and everyone was friendly with each other and all the bands were friends. And also, it was completely admitted that, like, both Blondie and the Ramones listened to a lot of Shangri Laws and lots of the song structures came from those 60s bands, and there wasn't any problem right. with that. And transparently, television, they, although they might not admit it so easily, <laughs> listened to a lot of The Grateful Dead. Yeah. And, and that, but then when it became like it had to be, I hate this and I hate that. It even became homophobic, like when it, right. the Orange County punk became like kind of the ROTC of music, and you had to be a certain way or you weren't allowable. That's where the, kind of like today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's when it loses its its purity, and like when when anyone when you think of like figures in, in punk that have mattered, it, it they usually skated those. You know, what I mean, like when you think of your Joe Strummers or like the the Ramones and like. These characters like that, they, they, they're they on the border, you know what I mean? Like, they're doing their own thing. And I found it really interesting, like, especially with, like, with television, the Ramones, Blondie, and the Mumps, you guys are all in the same scene, but musically, and, like, even, like, a, a, who else, Talking Heads, like, musically, like, 
d- different planets. You know what I mean? And, yeah. I would say that uh, Blondie and the Mumps have a lot of 60s damage. I mean, we both listen to a lot of 60s music and a lot of the kinks and stuff like that. Yeah. But we also listen to the Stooges and the Velvet Underground, so we tried to steal some of that rawness from them. But uh, to me, the, the celebration is kind of like that you could have all of those people, and we were all really good friends. And the Talking Heads transparently brought a more... Uh, uh, specific bass drums thing to yeah, it that yeah, you know yeah. other people didn't have. It was kind of like that was the a bulk of the songwriting went into that arrangement. And of course, that rhythm section is like one of the best rhythm sections either. Chris Vance, Frank, yeah. and Tina Weymouth. But I was always so envious. Right. Uh, but then you go on to even more radical things like. Uh, well, I happen to be in the contortions, but the contortions, right. are, and I happen to tune Lydia Lunch's guitar, but the Lydia Lunch, it, it was celebrating all the extremities you could imagine, and all of those people really liked each other and all got along with each other, and we were excited for our differences as much as we were excited for our similarities. But that's, that's, it was like a big buffet of craziness. So I, th- I think <laughs> that's you know, the ridiculous it. is the yeah. sublime was kind of the ethos. Right. The absurd is, is what's beautiful. And the fact yeah. that it, it worked out and everyone was supporting the, each other is a different style of thing. It became one beautiful like uh, a celebra- celebration of art as opposed to this. No, that's not punk. So, yeah, but, the, like, the one weird thing about that era to me was, you know, sometimes you're in an era and you don't actually realize that it's remarkable. And then later on you go like, oh, my God, it's so amazing. I wish I'd done more. But in that era, I think everybody knew it's the only time an apartment in New York will ever be sixty dollars. Right. It's the only time every single person that you know within a three mile radius is making an independent film or opening a new nightclub or having an art show or starting a new band. You know, it was it was a crazy time and everybody kind of knew it and we all rushed to do stuff. So it's funny, I like I I have regrets about other parts of my life, but I don't have regrets about not going to bed before four o'clock AM for ten years. <laughs> That's awesome. During that era. Right. Well, how, just New York itself is always moving, right? And it's, it's a constant buzz of stuff that you can be doing. So, the, it, like, but to be in that time, I can't, like, was it immediate? Like, well, let's kind of, let's kind of catch up to that. So, you grew up in Santa Barbara, right? Yes. Okay. So, when did you go to New York? Like, was music. I went uh, to New York. Uh, it was. I was in high school with Lance Loud, of course, you know, that old story. Yes. And, that, and the Mumps CD just came out yesterday, in case your yep, listeners yep. don't know. But, but in any case, so we were obsessed with music, and Lance was the taught me to shoplift because he was too scared to shoplift <laughs> himself. So I shoplifted the Stooges and the Kinks and, and Sparks and all of those weird albums that no one was buying. And we would run home and listen to them. And, but also Lance was absolutely obsessed with the Velvet Underground and Andy Warhol. And I, this story, you might know this already or you might not, but he was one of those people that wrote Andy Warhol fan letters. Yeah. But Andy yeah, Warhol yeah. actually started calling him. <laughs> so he would get, he would get a phone and Pat Loud his mom would say oh it's Andy and then she'd kind of like think ooh you know that guy from New York who's an artist is kind of creepy he's calling my kid right but she'd always put him right through That's and cool. so we were just going to go to New York and have an adventure and get out of Santa Barbara and it, coming from Santa Barbara we kind of had this safety net we always knew we could crawl back with our tails between our legs if we failed which we did <laughs> so uh, it moved there when I was about. I don't think I was 18 yet, I, but it might have been when I just turned 18. Okay. Because I, uh, um, I graduated from high school six months early, and then I went to Cal Arts for a little bit, and I hated it so much. And Lance wanted to go to New York, and I wanted to get out of Cal Arts, and so yeah, so I must have been 18. Gotcha. So then we ran away to New York, and we lived at 15th Street and 7th Avenue. We didn't know where to live. We actually didn't know New York at all, and. You know, the, the the cliche thing is that we were too stupid to know you actually had to get a job and pay the rent. But we stayed there for about three or four months, maybe six months. And um, our friend Alonzo King, who went on to become a famous choreographer in San Francisco, but actually he was just a friend of ours from high school, came and lived with us. And we have very funny pictures of us in our sad little railroad flat. 
But immediately, like Lance, became friends with this guy named Norman Fisher, who was a, an esthete and an art collector, but he also happened to be a Coke dealer. He was David Bowie's Coke it, dealer what? later on. David Bowie's Coke dealer? <laughs> yeah, but that wasn't for a few years. But, right. but it was like it was one of those, you know, when Coke became... Yeah, Got started its grand ascendancy. There were some people that yeah. showed up that were r- rather remarkable. Jeez. Um, <laughs> but so we we went there and then we kind of f- flopped and went back to Santa Barbara for a while. And okay. that's when we we had always wanted to be in a band and we were practicing at the the Louds had a garage where everyone could just play the instruments and make all the racket they wanted. And then Pat would actually feed us afterwards. Even and, better. Um, and so we just made racket in there and then we came back and took it a little more seriously and tried to write some songs and then we sort of ended up on dick cavett and lance and jd doherty and i looked at each other and we said well now we're back in new york we're not leaving and so that's how we ended up staying there and after that i stayed there for about 15 years wow that's what a what a way to jump into it on a whim but like the dive head in head first you know that's the only way to experience that did um when did you meet lance I met Lance in high school. I okay. met him in art class. It's the cliche story that's right. in all the mom three issues. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But... Uh, but we were in this art class, and the and the reason we bonded right away was because we were the snarkiest people in the room. <laughs> and the uh, art teacher, who I didn't really understand what gay was yet, I was too young and stupid. But I later figured out, oh, he was once of the you know the type, the fancy, sarcastic gay person who's always putting everyone else down. Yeah. And so he he had us be his uh, class favorites, but he happily gave us poor grades because we were too busy gossiping with him to do the work. <laughs> and um, so we we just sort of bonded over that, and we were, and so we didn't think being an outsider was difficult. It didn't really bother us that people called us fags or any of that stuff because we thought like well, we don't like you anyway, and we don't respect your opinion. And then also there was the great kind of equalizer of music then. If you yeah. liked some music that somebody else in the class liked, you bonded with them. So we actually had quite a lot of friends through a variety of things that we liked. I remember when I was shoplifting, I shoplifted the Village Green Preservation Society for about seven or eight of my friends, Yeah. and I gave it to them in high school, <laughs> and none of them understood it. But one girl actually said, I tried to like that that album that you gave me. I found one song that's okay. And she was kind of giving me charity. And, you know, now it's one of the most highly respected albums yeah. of all time. But at that point, people thought, like, this is really weird. Right. I like the Grateful Dead or Traffic. Oh, that's awesome, though. <laughs> and, and, like, uh, it, it, well, it takes, it takes like, when you blow someone's mind like that, like, it's hard to grasp on to anything. And it's so interesting <laughs> that, like, the, the, the kind of ethics that comes with liking the Ramones or, or fill in the blank or the Stooges or the Grateful Dead, the ethics that comes with subscribing to that, w- what these guys stand for, like, it, it clicks immediately and, like, Oh, you like them too? Cool, I can get along with it. It's a weird phenomenon that people do, but uh, it definitely jumps ahead a few steps and makes it easier to make friends. Yeah, and also for us, because we were just a little post-hippie, like a little too young to be hippies, so we were snobby about hippies. And Lance knew this guy who was a, a poetry professor at, at UCSB or something, and so he actually had a house, and we were welcome there to go over there and just hang out. But they loved the Grateful Dead, and because we hated hippies, we hated the Grateful Dead. (laughs) But what we would do is they'd all get stoned, and then we'd put the uh, Grateful Dead, instead of on 33, we'd put it on 16, (laughs) and we would wait, and they never noticed. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Man, they're really going at this one. Next question. Moving on from that, once you guys, like, once once the band's a thing, right, was there a, yeah. a part in between, like, all this moving where you're writing songs? Is there ever, or did you wait to that moment you came back and were jamming in the garage? No, I was already writing songs before we went there. In fact, yeah. it was funny when I was, I, I got, I, after we went to New York and saw the New York Dolls, it kind of changed, like, I thought, like, you know, like, I never thought I could be like the Beatles or anything like that. But I thought, but when I saw the New York Dolls, I thought, not only are they the best band in the world, but it seems approachable. It seems like you can right. actually get up on stage and actually have a band. Whereas in, in Santa Barbara, we were all just playing around and doing 12 bar and, 
you know, we, I do have a funny story, though. So, like, the very first band I ever saw was The Sixpence, and they had a reg- regional hit, a cover of The Fortune Teller, which was done by yeah. Rolling Stones and a whole bunch of other bands. And um, so they were in a in a club in Santa Barbara called The Padded Cell. It kind of sounds like a movie made or, <laughs> maker made this stuff up. <laughs> yeah. But they went on to become the Strawberry Alarm Clock. But they oh, okay. were one of those bands that we saw them, and it just it, Fortune Teller seemed like I could write that in five minutes. <laughs> So the first song I wrote after I saw them was called I'm God, and it was a 12-bar blues silly thing. So I was, you know, I was playing around with the ethos of writing. But after I saw the New York Dolls, I really thought, like, well, I should start writing a bunch of songs with this band. And so that's how that came about. And the very earliest bands on, songs on the reissue are from that kind of um, – the ones with Michelle and Delilah that were when yeah. the band was still named Loud uh, were from me trying to be the New York Dolls. Gotcha. Well, I, 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 I kind of failed at it, but Back in the Street was a uh, transparent, like, I want to be in the New York Dolls, and I can't. <laughs> but it, you guys did you, which was way more important. And, like, but that's, it's it, it takes that kind of, like, that 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 little steps up, you know what I mean? Like the the, the yeah. grasp on to be a Beatle, like that to write like John Lennon or Paul McCartney. That's a big step. Like it takes those little steps to to gain it. And like seeing yeah. seeing that that, that twelve bar blues and writing a song called "Oh My God" and being behind like almost this. Is there a thing with like with a comedic comfort within writing? Do you think? Uh, well, you know, the things that we loved at the time, like I don't know if you ever saw American Family, but we loved the Bonzo Dog Band, which was sort of the English version of the Mothers of Invention. Yeah. But they were kind of a kinder, gentler, and less jazz-inflected Mothers of Invention. Okay. So. And so uh, uh, Grant and his band at the high school pep rally did a cover of their song, I'm Gonna Get You in My Tent, because <laughs> it's so expedient. So they did that song. So it, that was already kind of smart ass making fun of stuff, which right. we enjoyed. And um, but we, it, it was also aspirational. You know, they, we loved beautiful songs, and you know, tr- trying to find that ground. As I said, like I was very shut down by my family, and they always told me whenever I tried to play the piano, "Can you please stop? That's horrible." And I had a very negative response to trying to be a musician. And then when I went to the Louds, everyone was very welcoming. And they said, just do whatever you want. And it was at that certain point where you were allowed to have a learning curve. You know, between surf and 12-bar blues, most people could get through one song with their friends and have a good laugh. But by the time we got to the mumps, I was trying to write like the Kinks and like Bonzo Dog and like the Beatles and like all of the other things that I loved and, and also do crazy stuff like the Velvet Underground and the Stooges and also be in your face with the lyrics you know, because I I admired clever and I admired meaningfulness and I admired statements. So, and I admired things that made me really sad. <laughs> and I put those all together in the mixer, and came out with some kind of sour puss stuff. But it's it's rock. It, it is it's all there and it's all rock and all those influences. Now that I hear you say them, I hear mm-hmm. within those recordings because I I had the uh, advanced of of this mix of stuff right, and like uh. When did so to kind of like to kind of keep keep on track? Um, when did an American family become a because th- to have a family like that that's just opening and accepting is a rare is a rare a rare th- a nurturing environment. It sounds to say that it's weird to say that it's rare, but it is rare. In, the, in, in like so when that sit or when the reality TV thing came in, was that while you guys were in New York or when when did that happen? It was, we had come back from New York and then Lance had moved back to New York and he was living with this guy named Soren Ashenu in the Chelsea Hotel and I wasn't there yet. Okay. And and then he came back during it and then we worked on the band, Uh, but we weren't working on that band during American Family. Uh, American Family was weird though because... um, Lance was living in New York, and th- th- after he was through with Soren Ajno, he moved to this apartment over a pickle factory that was with Barry. <laughs> oh, I always forget his name. He was in that band, The Silver Apples. That's kind of legendary. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, yeah. Th- but they're a terrible band. <laughs> but in any case, you can look it up, but his name was Barry, and he was Lance's lover because Lance always managed to get somebody who would let him live at their house. Nice. And so we lived at his house for a while. 
And then Barry uh, w- was also an aspirant artist, and so he got this kind of grant to go to Denmark, and there was a bridge from Denmark to Sweden. You know, when I tell this story, this is my understanding from back then when I was like 17 or something, because is there a bridge from Denmark to Sweden? I don't really know. But he he was paid to spray paint in silver spray paint this these words milieu protection and protection was spelled with a K on this highway on a bridge Whoa. outside of Denmark. Yeah. And so we all just decided to go to Denmark <laughs> and this happened to be when American Family was being filmed. So there's you know, there's a, like one minute of me doing my long hair and over the pickle <laughs> factory and then the next episode we're in Denmark and Lance and I were really happy in Denmark and we had a great time we were living in the basement of this beautiful 200 year old farmhouse it was kind of in the country it was funny because it you could walk outside of the farmhouse and there were some uh, huge guns that were left from World War II that were facing outwards and they just had flowers and weeds growing all over them but uh so we we were just staying there, but it was a bus ride away from Copenhagen. So we'd go into Copenhagen, and my uh, forebears on my mother's side are all Danish. So I I knew some stuff about Denmark, and it was really fun. And we were staying there and having a really good time. And Barry did the the spray paint thing, and then the filmmakers Alan and Susan Raymond said, "We're bored. We want to go someplace else. We're in Europe. We should go someplace else. So this is the one part that it's always weird to me. It was supposed to be a documentary, yeah. but they didn't film the filmmakers. And even at the time when I was that young, I was thinking like, well, you're making a decision about where we're going, and yet your decision is not included in the documentary. Because we said, we'll go to Paris if you pay for it. <laughs> and so they paid for it. Nice. And. And so we ended up in Paris, and that was really fun. And we found this little third floor walk up in a townhouse that's in the in the series. And Lance and I were there, and we were running around. And Rene Ricard went from the Andy Warhol subset of superstars came up to us because he saw the cameras and he thought we were rich. Yeah. But we knew who he was because yeah. we were totally into Andy Warhol, so it was really exciting. And we ran around there and. Uh, I was kind of dating this girl who was an Yves Saint Laurent model, although she didn't speak any English. Yeah. And so, and we would go to this place called Le Drug Store, that was the place where you could get American style food. And we were having a great time there. And Lance found another new boyfriend who gave us a bunch of vintage ties, some of which I still have. One of them is pictures of uh, deers and rifles and bullets yeah. <laughs> all on the same tie. A very happy, cheery sort of tie to have. Right. And then I got drafted. Yeah. So I was called, I was given a telegram, I was with Lance and in Paris, and we were just going to stay there, and I got a telegram that said, unless you come back to America tomorrow, you will never be allowed in America again. Damn. And so then I had to leave the next day, I was sick, vomiting all night, then I got on the plane and went back to Santa Barbara and faced the draft board, and they classified me 1A, even though I was raised as a Quaker. And all of my brothers had gotten out to be conscientious objections, uh, objectors, but Santa Barbara was such a small town. Then they actually said to me, we know you Hoffmans, and your brothers have already gotten out of this, so you're not getting out. And I, we don't really believe you're a Quaker. And I was thinking, like, well, I went to Quaker. You know, the yeah. Quakers don't believe in churches. Right. So you go to Quaker meeting, and you don't have priests. It's really a fantastic religion because you don't have right. to believe anything, and you just have to be nice. And... So in any case, they classified me 1A, but the lottery came up, and yeah. uh, so I didn't get drafted after all, because my parents were making all these preparations for me to move to Canada. Yeah. And meanwhile, Lance didn't ever report. <laughs> and so any time he got stopped by the police in a car, he could have just gone straight to jail for being right. a draft dodger. But then he was high in the in the lottery as well. So that's how that Parisian experiment ended, right. and then we went to New York. <laughs> oh, jeez. What a what a crazy tale, man! <laughs> wow, like that, that. Well, one thing about Quakers, which is very interesting, is isn't it like in 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 a, a traditional like setting as far as like a church? There's like an open discussion, right? That happens. But there's no. They don't have churches. What they have is they have meeting places, right. and originally it would be in someone's house. 
So uh, sometimes they're called meeting houses. It's funny because Richard Nixon was of a different branch of Quakers yeah. that were uh, actually started to have priests and churches, and he identified as a Quaker, and all of the Quakers were up in arms, if you can say that about a Quaker, because they don't believe in arms either. But they said, like, well, what shall we disassociate ourselves from him because he doesn't, he, that isn't the true spirit of Quakerism. And uh, the, the, it was the first time I ever heard this, and the, and the meeting elders, they said, you don't punish the lamb because he's lost. And I've actually thought of that many times yeah. over the course of my life. But they never believed anyone was closer to God than anyone else, and that's why they didn't have priests. And all you would do is you'd sit around in a room in silence, and if someone was moved by their experience that week, they would stand up and say something. And as a child, it was monumentally boring. You know, like church is all kind of like about showbiz. There's right. All this glamour, and there's <laughs> incense going up and down the aisles, and there's a choir singing something, and there's stained glass windows with dead people all over them. We didn't have any of that stuff. We just sat, sat in a plain room with a bunch of people who sometimes would tell a really boring story. <laughs> so, but that, but really... later on, I came to be so grateful for that upbringing right. because it, ta it taught me the religion of doubt. <laughs> <laughs> right, but the, it also makes the mundane spiritual. In 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 it is, you know, what I mean, like every anything can be enlightening if looked at in the right way. And like, well, not only that, but the basic precept of, of Quakerism is you don't ever hurt anybody. You know, right. so it's and also if like if a robber comes into your house, you give them what they want because they probably need it more than you do. There's yeah. you know all the stories and the teachings of the Quakers are like that. And it's not a punitive religion, it's a forgiving religion, and it's, it's, there's no mention of you're going to go to hell if you do this. Right. The only thing they have that's an idea of right and wrong is that it's better to be kind to people than to be unkind to people. It's, it's yeah. very simplistic, and right. it's kind of like what I thought Buddhism was like, and I thought, oh, Buddhism is the wiser, more grounded Quakerism, but Buddhism has factions that are very militaristic, so... It's it's strange when you learn more about religion. So I like Quakers. They're yeah. sensible. <laughs> they're boring, but they're sensible. That, that's what keeps them that way. I get like there. I agree. <laughs> there's all these frac. Any bureaucracy of a thing is going to have some some like subsect of thing that is more important than the other, or, or thought of as more important. But that that's really fascinating. Um, and the great thing about Quakerism is my uh, my parents were spiritual adventurers, so they were trying to find something or anything they could believe in together, and they they weren't raised as Quakers. They found Quakerism. I didn't know that because it all happened before I was born, but right. I found out later. That's so. that's awesome, because it, then it's not something you're forced into. It's something you chose. And there's always yeah. something. There's like a, there, There's like this appreciation for finding a thing and being able to say yes to it as opposed to being – slammed into it that yeah. that's fascinating um so uh, now once the band gets going and tunes get written and like the collaboration comes together and you guys are hitting the scene playing with like was it so the first show was with television right and was it it was yes it was cbgb's yes okay and like when, it was richard hell that showed yeah rob dupre also worked at cinemabilia i don't think we i think maybe by then he wasn't working there anymore but rob dupre and i were already good friends rob dupre was found for the band by this artist named duncan Hanna, who of course like everybody else has a autobiography out there in case right. you're interested but so uh, and richard Hell was really really nice and he invited us to go there and then he got us to open for television and we were really in awe of television even though right. they're Guitar solos were too long for us, <laughs> but they were beautiful orchestrated guitar solos and very impressive. And then, of course, Richard Held was kind of the clown of the group, which is why I guess he couldn't stay in it because yeah. he took too much of the spotlight away. But in the beginning, it was just great. It was just like personality time 10. And... Um, and so that we were welcomed into that fold when we weren't anything like that, like there wasn't anything particularly serious about the mumps, but they just were completely friendly of towards us until Tom Verlaine tried to steal Rob Dupre from us. Yeah. yeah. That, that was kind of like a point of departure. Yeah. It, it, and I was shocked because Rob was in love with television that he actually decided to stay with us as a real measure of how, you know, seriously he felt about our relationship musically. And so that was wonderful. 
But right. in any case, so that so we got there, and uh, television were very early on the scene, and then, as I recall it, there were lots and lots of bands. I mean, like Debbie Harry was in a band called The Stilettos, with Elda Stiletto, and we used to go see her. I was friends with Ron Ross, who ended up being kind of a promoter of sorts and worked for record companies, and he and I would go and see The Stilettos, and... Elder Stiletto had this incredible song called I Left My Wednesday Panties in Passaic, that's in New Jersey, and just loved that song. And so that's when we met Debbie Harry, and, and then they went on to have Blondie, and we right. met Christine and everything, and, and so they started playing at CBGB's. But it was very familial because there wasn't much competition to get in there in the beginning, and everyone was welcome. And so it was a, you know, you were wondering as a band, like when Lance and I were writing songs in in our little apartment, and I was actually writing my songs on an M and E organ. I don't know if yeah. you know what those are, but they're a toy for kids because right. I didn't have a keyboard. And um, with the fan under it, right? No, no, it's just a little electric thing. It's about as big as maybe a microwave. Right. And it has a little keyboard that's maybe two octaves, and it sounds like a really bad organ. And that's what I was writing my songs on. That's but awesome. but in any case, so it, it was just welcoming, and it was an easy place to go, and everyone heard about it, and also all the people who were as aspirant bands uh, were there. Oh, the other thing I have to say is, like, when we moved to New York after American Family, the second time we moved there, um, uh, Paul Zone, who was in this band called The Fast, do you know them? Mm-hmm. I'm not— Yeah, I'm... so—, so Sorry, familiar with, well, not like I, I couldn't go into a detail about them yeah. yet. So, but yeah. Well, they were a band that already existed, and they were kind of based on The Who, although they had a much wilder sense of humor than The Who. Yeah. And Paul Zone wasn't even in them. Mandy Zone was the lead singer at that point. But he was kind of like the meter and greeter, and he get, came and met me and Lance, and I, it didn't even occur to me that he met us because we were on TV, <laughs> which in retrospect, I think like, oh, maybe he met us because we were sort of famous. But but at that time, I didn't feel famous. And when American Family came out, you know, they liked everything about the documentary, but all of the reviews of the people were finding them hopeless, like they called Lance an evil flower. And, you know, we were just um, completely criticized as clueless buffoons. And so it never occurred to me that people might want to meet you because of that. But in any right. case, Paul Zone took us around to see Another Pretty Face and uh, the Harlots of 42nd Street, and we met Eric Emerson through him, and he got us into the back room at Max's and all this crazy stuff. And he was kind of like our coach be- before CBGB's happened. And then they started pl- the Fast started playing at CBGB's too, and Paul Zone's parents lived in uh, Bensonhurst, and they would have us go out there, and his mom would cook dinner for us and it was kind of like another loud family <laughs> like they were re- really yeah. friendly and took care of us and he would drive he had a car so he was he would take us to coney island and it was, you know so he really helped us get into a scene and we saw the dictators all the time and all that stuff that was sort of in between the new york dolls and punk he kept us on top of that and then he was with us right through the whole cbgb's thing too so that's amazing. You need a guide. You need a guide to show you yeah, all the Yeah, because hidden... we were from Santa Barbara. I mean, we we found the New York Dolls by ourselves, and we saw a lot of stuff. But uh, I do have a picture that I took myself of David Bowie at a New York Dolls concert. Yeah? <laughs> well, that's so sick. That's so sick. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so as that's happening, like, what uh, did you did you ever run into Peter Loeffner? From Cream Magazine, I, and he uh, he played with a uh, Rocket from the Tombs, which was a uh, the kind of you sent me that really cool autograph from uh, David Thomas in the yeah. email chain, um, which and he played in Perubu as well. Yeah, so that's what I would have no- known him from. I know Rocket from the Tombs, but I don't, and I'm sure I saw them, but I don't know them well. But also because Crocus was uh, staying with Miriam Lina, who I was kind of going out with at the time. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, it, it, we were kind of in love, but not a sexual love. But we, yeah. you know, she, I lived in Brooklyn at that time, and she lived in Manhattan. So I stayed at her house all the time, and we slept next to each other. But there was never any sex, and we wore pajamas. But I saw her every single day, and she was friends with Per Ubu. And so when Crocus came, he would stay with her. 
And so I got to know him pretty well. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, it was that kind of crazy scene. It, it, it was so easy. Like when the Cramps first came, I just loved them, and I thought right. they were the best band since the New York Dolls. And then the weird thing is, we became really good friends with them and friends with them for 30 years. And they actually encouraged me and Lance to move to LA and you know, all of this when we finally did make the move from New York. And so it was a scene and it, and you remain friends with people and you know, Ivy played on one of my records and yeah, and we so got sick. our guitar player, Robert Mache was one of their roadies. He, that was a funny guy. Like we met him and I didn't even know he played an instrument and he was living with Brian Gregory at the time. And I was trying to start this joke band during the months, and I thought, like, I'm so tired of being in serious bands. I just want to do a band that's a joke. And it was called The Swinging Madisons. And I asked Robert, like, well, do you play anything? And he said, yeah, I can play a little saxophone. So he joined on saxophone, and we had this great guitar player who had tried out for The Runaways but hadn't gotten into The Runaways. Her name was Allison East, and she was really incredible. Uh, but she quit because she thought it wasn't serious enough. Well, I've been yeah. friends with her after that, but it was just like... And so I said, well, what am I going to do now? And Robert said, well, I play guitar. And he just moved up. To, he had played saxophone, then bass, and then guitar. And he, we only met him because he was the roadie for the cramps. So That's so cool. That was what it was like. You just yeah. meet all these crazy people and do something silly with them. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. And Ivy, what a guitar player. Man, I would love yeah. to chat with her. Um, but uh, to kind of – so as this has happened, when you and Lance were, like, writing tunes on this – tiny piano like what was it like you had an, a, a phrase stuck in mind was it like a collaborative effort on lyrics and melody because you're we didn't really write songs together okay i wrote those songs he there were a couple of songs that we worked on together i think we which was it uh what would happen is lance would have like before the mums lance wrote muscle boys which is this song that was by quote unquote loud on dick cavett yeah and he and he wrote that with our really good friend and original guitar player david collar it's an incredible guitar player really he sort of set the bar for genius and he could play anything but he decided modern music that he didn't like modern music so mm. he started the swing band with grant loud and he quit that band and that's one of the reasons why he went back to Santa Barbara instead of staying with us in New York, because he didn't want to be in a, a sort of rock scene anymore. But so he wrote Muscle Boys with Lance. And then I wrote, no, that song that's uh, the, one of the extra tracks from the new CD, Cha Cha yeah. Cha, I wrote that with Lance. It was his idea to do a song about Cha Cha Cha, only <laughs> making fun of Cha Cha Cha. And it yeah. has some songs that are unforgivable in this era we were making fun of racist racists in the lyrics so it, it said cha-cha-cha spicks and waffles will know the lingo but you'll learn their dance by jingo jingo yeah. and and that is you know in this arena that is completely unforgivable whereas right. in that arena you could actually satirize how stupid racists were right right and you're not allowed to do that anymore and so it's funny that they actually agreed to put that song out, and I, I'm glad we don't have a lyric sheet. But I don't want people throwing things at me on the street. <laughs> sure. But, I mean, there's a, I guess, I, I don't, it's not good nor bad, right? But, like, it, it, to be able to kind of make fun of someone's racism, like, it sucks that that's bad, too? Right? Does that, I, I don't know, like, because... It, it, I think that there's degrees of enlightenment, and right. we, and also, the, you know, you have to, the, you know, I confess, I come from a position of white privilege. Right, I was right. raised by an upper middle class family in a Same. kind of a white person, a white person's resort. Like it didn't even occur to me because I was so blinkered by my upbringing when we met Alonzo, who's black. It didn't occur to me then that he was poorer than we were. I just thought like he came from a fabulous family who welcomed us into right. their little house, and we lived in a great big house. I was too stupid to even realize there was some kind of dichotomy there. But I also think you know there were these great satire bands that actually had political cachet, like the Mothers of Invention, right. who were making a great mark by making fun of things that they thought were detestable, and they made it clear they thought were detestable, but they made those things clear through humor and wit. Right. Where the wit was kind of scathing. And and I think it's, you know, it's good to be sensitive to these things and everything evolves. And now we're at a point 
But I, I do think it was also kind of post hippie and during like when the hippies were around they didn't hate fags until later you know right. later they thought oh well, fags are weird but in the beginning yeah. if it feels good do it was the ethos and so we didn't feel threatened the way fags did maybe in the mid 70s late 70s or we, we and also since lance and i were kind of out already we didn't have to come out we didn't have to do any of that stuff it was just and and at first uh you know CBGB's, like I said, was very welcoming to people right. who have another sexual ethos or pattern. So, so I, I realize how it becomes more of a battle later on, but it is it is weird how so much of language is forbidden now. Right. And to me, it's kind of, a, it's like saying history is forbidden. It's like as soon as you're not allowed to say something, then you, you're you erasing part of history, and then you can't really learn from it anymore. I agree. No, I agree. I think it's it's important to be able to learn from mistakes and it's important for people to be able to be, uh, to apologize and move on from it. Like, it, you know, that's, uh, and if you take that away, it's, it, there's no growth really. It's just kind of stagnant. Um, but, uh, the kind of like the kind of bounce it back to music cause it's, um, uh, going from that. So you guys are writing these tunes, right. And like, like, it's interesting to hear your growth, uh, through composition from the mumps to your solo career, because like uh -huh. listening, because I, I did the whole gambit in, in 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 research for this that I could that I can get a uh, uh, I could get a hold of, and like my listen... God, glutton for punishment! <laughs> no, it was awesome because like you take a song like Fatal Charm, which has like this, it has a harpsichord on it, which you hear a lot later uh -huh. in, in your stylings on your solo records, like when a uh, 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 um, don't love my guru anymore. It came out like it had a little more of that tonality and like this kind of shape. Yeah. And and the most well, we loved the Left Bank. I mean, and we loved the Bee Gees too. You know, right. we loved all that stuff. And and it that was one of the things that was weird about punk rock was because you were supposed to disown all that stuff. And m most of the songwriters who I knew didn't disown that stuff. They just took the influences they loved the most and they put those at the forefront. And so we loved, uh, we also loved variety. We thought like you can play a really hard rock song next to one that has harpsichord or, you know, if you, if you think of a song like the awkward age or something that the mumps actually tried to do that didn't have, didn't fit Lance's voice at all. And, but it was, it was very aspirational in melody and format and it didn't have to have a bridge for instance. And, all the, you know, I was always playing with form, and you were encouraged to do that. You were encouraged to, like, rethink how much was possible in songwriting. And my only kind of ethos in songwriting was, well, I hope it's catchy, and maybe the lyrics are amusing, but they might make you think a thought you hadn't thought before. Right. So... No, I think. And so I, I was, I tried that. I, I don't love my guru anymore. It's funny because that was like a whole bunch of songs that I thought, well, these are too folk for me. Yeah. And then the record company said, well, why don't you just do your folk songs for an album? And then I did it. And then of course I threw a bunch of, I don't love my guru anymore. The, the joke song on there and stuff like that. So it was kind of a variety of pack in my generation, but, um, but it, it was mostly acoustic stuff and I never felt free to kind of, uh, you know, engage that part of my musical psyche. And they said, sure, just go ahead and do it. And so by the time I got the pop and Gary Stewart said, why don't you just make the most grandiose record you've ever made in your life? I was ready to do it. I was ready to be that playful with all the aspects of musical possibility. That, that may, that makes so much sense because like, so with like, don't love first don't love my guru anymore like that's like almost like a funk song like that rhythm track even though it's acoustic yeah. instruments you know like that that's got a pocket so it yeah. makes sense that <laughs> it does it like that's like this is one we gotta talk about what oh it's this one okay cool it's a title track um but like it, the progression through your solo stuff like when you get to like and which was the 2002 record where you did a bunch of features and stuff did that like for fop did that kind of like for like cement that the like what's what was the takeaway from that because uh fop like it's, it's like it's like the pinnacle it's like all this stuff that you it seems like you were you're going for happened on that record and like well, it, you know if i may be so bold and i you know i think most bands have their sergeant pepper or their aspirational sergeant pepper or their right. wannabe sergeant pepper 
And so that was uh, that was supposed to be my big album. Unfortunately, it was my it's also my most recent album. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I, I've done work with a whole lot of other people since then. But but in any case, it, yeah, it, the thing about it was that. Um, I had a record company, Greg Dwinell ran Egbert Records, and he was completely supportive of me, and that's very rare. And also, he would put out my records even if the previous record didn't sell very much. And so I didn't really have to worry about that. I was hoping people would like me, and I had a a very, uh, you know, I had a small but ardent following, and because I had those hits with Klaus Nomi, there was always the curiosity factor and everything. But I was very blessed to have a guy, to, and so I was doing a joke, 45, with Belinda Carlisle, which unfortunately didn't happen because she had to go back to France suddenly. But um, And then the guy said, oh, you're going to do a duet. Why don't you just do this album of duets? And, and so I did, and then that ended up – everyone I asked to be on that album just said yes. It was the weird – you know, I was – in awe of Sparks. It's just funny because the few times I met them, I loved them so much that I was kind of scared to talk. It was funny, like David Johansson once, because I was at every single New York Dolls concert, he invited me to go with him and the rest of the band to some party on Long Island, which I don't think I'd ever been to before. It seemed like we were going to France or something. And I was so in awe of him that I didn't say anything the entire time. <laughs> I was scared I'd seem stupid. Right, and right. And so... Um, so, uh, you know, when I'd met Ron and Russell, and they were managed by the same management, but I ju- just didn't know what to say to them. I thought, like, you're, you're so great, but I don't want to seem like a sycophant, and I just didn't know what to say to them. And so when Russell said, oh, sure, I'll be on the record, and even when he was doing it, I thought, like, well, why are you doing this? And he said, well, I, first of all, I like the song, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so And so everyone I asked just said yes. And so that was really kind of eye-opening that the – I was in another musical community, even though right. it wasn't as tight knit as the East Village, where people were interested in each other's like adventures, and so that that was so that helped me with VOP. I just felt like, well, we can play around, and that I could have, say, Russell Mayo, Rufus Wainwright, and Lydia Lunch all on the same record, and they were all enthusiastic about it. You know, that's actually kind of a wild dichotomy of crazy artists. Right, but it's so awesome, like yeah. it, and like it, it won't just to get that support because like it, it, to have that like it's when you have a group of people that are like we're behind your song like and it it's easier to see like in the in the smaller context of like we're in the van we're gonna play the gig oh we gotta do that song and this song and you're like oh people care about these songs I wrote they want it they want to present it in a certain order like it means yeah. that much and there's there's kind of like this like. To, 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 when you write a song and someone else cares as much about it or even more than you do is is i don't it's a kind of undescribable amount of support and like yeah, that, I'm, it's oddly blessed that way like when we did you know the cbgb's west thing at the theater i produced these kind of tribute shows for a while at the steve allen theater sadly passed now in the legend but uh, you know maria mckee just said oh well i'd love to sing awkward age you know <laughs> to people that i had admired from afar suddenly would just show up and do those shows and you know i met ursula geringer and or what well, she's also called ursula newts and i don't know what she's called commercially but uh timor beck Bosanoff and prince poppycock all of these crazy opera singers i met wow. and they all came and they sang my songs or would sing other people's songs and tributes i did and it's just that, you know, I've been very lucky that way. Even if I haven't sold any records, I've been very blessed with an incredible musical community. So, Right. That's so cool. Like, well, that's like, that's, uh, I was talking with a, my guitar teacher and he's like, I went and saw one of his gigs and he's like, this is the takeaway, Dave. And he kind of talks like that. Um, he's like, the takeaway is this. They came out from this thing. It's the people. It's the relations. That's where your, that's where your wealth is doing this type of thing. And like, that's a, a beautiful example of it. Just what you went through with it. Like, that's so cool. And like, the um, what was I gonna say? So the takeaway from the, but uh, what led like the kind of into your solo career? You did work with the Contortions, and like, so yeah. w- when the Mumps kind of split up, um, was that just was that just burn from? Yes, it was, yeah. it was exhaustion. We'd been playing together for almost seven years, and we had the, you know, playing at CBGB's and having a CBGB's family was just marvelous. 
at the beginning, and then as almost every single band from then, I always use Tough Darts and Robert Gordon, and God bless their souls, but, you know, moderate talents at best, and they went on to have major label record contracts, and we just sat there with nothing. And then there was a one time, you know, we were really close friends with the Dickies, and we loved them. We loved the Dickies and the Quick and all those bands. And we played with them loads and loads of times, but it turned out that our management managed the Dickies and the Mums at the same time. And the Dickies played on our records and stuff, so there wasn't any uh, there wasn't any competition between us. But A and M Records at that point wanted a token punk band because they mm. thought it might break. Yeah, you know, it was just kind of like one of those uh, against the the possibility that they might sell a record. So they were going to sign one. And so our managers put up us and the Dickies and they actually said, we don't want the band with the fag in it. Mm. And so that, that was one thing that we felt like was kind of a slap in the face, but we kept going for a couple of years after that. And we had a fan, we had a whole alternate family in LA and met all, you know, we met the Go-Go's and a, a kid Congo powers. who was then Brian Tristan right. was one of our best friends. And we stayed at the screamers house and we had a whole LA family as well. And then we moved back and, and worked in, in New York for a couple more years. And we had that opportunity with Sire records where we did a demo for them. And, uh, we thought like, well, if this doesn't work out, maybe we just can't go any further. We can't go any further without an album. It just isn't working. People were burnt out. And the one thing that I had done, which people became resentful of at one point, I'm still friends with everyone that's still alive, which is a horrific, horrific thing to have to say. Right. But um, I just said yes to any opportunity that came because, I, I, like I said, we were cognizant of the fact that CBGBs may seem normal at the time you're in it. But to me, it just also seemed like this is a golden era and I'm in it and I know it. So when I got the chance to be a cat and a mung and James White and the Blacks or play guitar in the contortions, I said yes. When I got the chance to write songs for Klaus Nomi, I said yes. When I was going to start a folk band called Bleecker Street Incident with Dan Magnus, I just did it, you yeah. know, and then I started my own band and all that stuff. And, and uh, the, the band thought that I was kind of dissipating my songwriting prowess by being in all these different projects at once, which I, <laughs> in retrospect, I disagree with because I, I think some of the songs I wrote at the very end, like We're American, I think that's one of the songs, funniest songs the Mumps ever did. And we did that song when we were opening for Squeeze and there was a lot of optimism about our career at the time. So, But in any case, it, it, they did think I was spreading myself too thin and I wasn't being loyal and so there was some friction in the band about that and if we had suddenly gotten a record contract from Sire everything would have been different we would have been supported right. by a company and we would have recorded our signature album and you know then we would have it, maybe the record wouldn't have sold like Tough Darts didn't sell but at least we'd have that statement yeah. and Mumps were one of the only bands out of CBGB's that was never allowed to have that statement yeah that's pretty wild but it never got to that. But this is this is it, though. This collection yeah. of songs that's coming out now is that statement, and like, or I mean, there was that Fatal Charm well, collection, right? Uh, yeah. Well, there's been it's this is the third time it's been reissued, and believe me, I don't know how we were lucky enough to be that charmed that people still care about this music all of this decades later, and enough to reissue it three times and this is a fantastic version of it and has songs on it that have never been recorded and it sounds better and everything uh, I'm, I'm very happy about it and the people at Omnivore are absolutely marvelous and friendly and easy to get along with and have a great sense of humor and there's other so many other fantastic bands on that label that it's great to be kind of like their brothers in this effort but we also got like the, like the last one we got was Long Gone John. I don't know if you know about him, but he's a huge eccentric. But he said, "I'm going to put out the most fantastic retrospective you've ever seen, and I'm going to make a companion DVD to it, and I will never pay you one single cent." And that was his pitch to us. <laughs> uh, and we all said, "Sure." All right. Nobody cared about right. us then, and he did. He put out a thing with a 24-page color booklet, and it had a DVD with the optional commentary and all this crazy shit. I think he made about a thousand copies of it. I don't know if anybody ever bought it, but it was it put it got us in print again, and it kept the legend alive. And it's just, you know, for being the one band that wasn't really signed, we we're lucky to have our canon, if you will, 
reissued three times, and every time it's been a little bit more fantastic. And and we're just blessed that way. But it's, it's also, you know, if you think about like half of the songs on it are songs we made in the four track when Dave D. Doherty was still in the band in Rob Dupre's bedroom. Wow. You know, it's like yeah. we weren't allowed studio treatment of right. uh, some of our songs. We just made do. And I think in retrospect, we made do pretty well. But I, I occasionally imagine, like, what if we were allowed a string arrangement on one of those songs or an outside musician or a better recording instance or something? It, I think it, it, it'd be really interesting. I think it would kind of be similar to what you did later. I think the Mumps is a really beautiful, like, like in, in the best way, rough, like, cut of, like, some of your later work because that orchestration and that songwriting and that play with form and that satire is there and it's delivered in this this raw punk energy that that you uh, polish later and do in, a much, like, a completely different form and it's just as fantastic, but, like... The mumps got that 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 edge to it, and maybe it was because there was a lack there, uh, not being able to hire the string section or get in the studio like that. But I think it was also because we were we were that first band. I mean, we'd had joke bands in high school, yeah, and we always had bands. And there's that funny thing that we played as what I think we were called fuck, but they wrote it as <laughs> fork so that we wouldn't get in trouble. Yeah. And somehow Pat Loud got us to play for the cast party of the Los Angeles version of hair. And we played there and we stole their sound system and all that kind of stuff you do in high school. Yeah. But, uh, but actually a month was our real band. It was kind of like our version of whatever first band you have. And, and right. in a real band like that, you're almost like brethren you're related and you react to each other with the love and the forgiveness of brothers, but also with the neurotic, <laughs> you know, ex expectation of brothers. And, you know, you're, you're so close that if you move your elbow, you're going to hurt somebody. And, right. and we were that way. And, and it's when I started the swinging Madisons, I kind of thought like, I want to start a band where there's no pressure. It's, Gotcha. You know, it yeah, was yeah. because it, it 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 got heavy. You know, we didn't we kind of turned inward and didn't have anyone to blame but each other, and there was never anything like you're a bad songwriter or anything like that. There was never any question of each other's talent or dedication, but there was kind of like well, our, our little personality f defects started to wear on people when we didn't have that outside modicum of success that would have helped right. us express ourselves in new ways. You know, we just kept playing the same clubs. And fortunately for us, at the end, the audiences were just as ravenous as they were from the very beginning. We were, that was one thing that also the punk era is, it was familial all of, across the country because of those back pages and weird fanzines where people would get in touch with each other. I didn't even realize this at the time until we got a stock or sent me her retainer in the mail. <laughs> but, uh, uh, okay. That, there were people all over the country that were yeah. uh, contacting each other through the mail. So we would get to Philadelphia for the first time and there'd be all these kids would take us back to their family's house for spaghetti oh, and we, you could yeah. be guaranteed to have an audience wherever you went just because you were coming from cbgb's or an la band was coming from wherever they were coming from and everyone was so excited it was a real outlet and it, you know of course i mentioned so it's pre-computer but yeah. but it, it, it was easy so we could go we were lucky enough to be able to drive across america three or four times and we always had a place to stay and a place to play and it'd always be full that's and amazing. even to, at the very end of the mumps career, you know, we were playing to crazy crowds. And by that time, they had gotten to be kind of teeny bop girls, which was weird for a faggy band like ours. But we welcomed <laughs> it, and it was really exciting. That's and awesome. they did throw their underwear, and I have some of it. <laughs> and retainers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's so cool. Wow, like it's it's uh, to kind of compare the two scenes because you've got a, a really cool perspective of both the CBGB scene and the LA scene, like being able to hang out with the screamers and stuff. And I saw, I saw a picture of you guys um, from from the documentary 
the American uh, Family documentary or Death In. Um, there, you guys opened for like Van Halen. So what was like, what was the difference of like kind of the t- the two coasts? Was there like a and w- well, or was it very similar? That, to, to me, about that was that the New York uh, contingent, if you will, sort of came into awareness of their sort of heft as a movement a little bit earlier than Los Angeles did, and that made Los Angeles be very enthusiastic towards New York at first and kind of resentful of New York afterwards. Like, because when we, we were actually, because we had the manager who also managed Bart Joseph Fleury, wonderful, wonderful person, and unfortunately he's one of the people who I miss because he happens to be dead. Uh, so that's not yeah. pleasant to revisit. But in any case, he took great care of us, and he said, I'm going to get you to L.A. before anybody else, and you're going to be the first New York band to ever play L.A., and it's really going to be fun. And we drove across country together with our other manager, Fred Maneo, and we had borrowed some cars and did all this crazy stuff. And, and uh, oh, and we was also there was a manager called John Hewlett who was in John's Children in England, and he was friends with Joseph Flurry, so he helped us in the beginning. And so we got across there, and the minute we got into LA, there was Van Halen who were just having their record release, and it was their they had it hadn't come out yet, so it was the celebration of their first album. Wow. And uh, then we were there as the first New York band to ever play in LA. Yeah. And it. And there was a huge contingent of kids that just wanted to come see us because they'd read all about New York and Rock Scene magazine and in, in New York Rocker and all that kind of stuff you could get. And so they were completely, wildly supportive. And then there were people that were there specifically to see Van Halen, and you would think it would be kind of like you know, a battle of the bands. Right. But it wasn't like that at all because David Lee Roth had a, such a fantastic sense of humor and he encouraged people to like us, and he made jokes about us on stage. And he, you know, he made a joke, well, they think they're punks. I'm the atomic punk and stuff like that. <laughs> and, and he was super friendly backstage, and all of the, uh, Van Halen were. And so it was kind of a celebration. And we had the same experience when we opened for Cheap Trick the next time we came out. And uh, they were really super friendly, and it was really a good match. And because they were kind of a, you know, they were, had a little tiny bit of revolutionary, uh, to, like a petite sous punk about them. Cause, right. And, and so it was just fun. So the first time we came out there, like all people who were going to be in bands later, like Pleasant Gaiman was in the front, some member, future members of X were there, all these yeah. people, some Go-Go's and, yeah. and people like that were all in the audience and they all had loads and loads of friends and they, and the Screamers were the official welcoming club and every band that came through L.A., they would invite you to stay at their house and so you, we were really lucky to be there. The first time I went there, Brian Tristan, who became Kid Cod Come Powers, was actually living in the closet and typing their fan club letter and uh so they were super super friendly and it was it was just like another aspect of the party and when we uh, we oh my god we lived at the tropicana for a couple of months and that was quite a scene and so so it was just ridiculous and then the next time we came back we were still welcomed and the people were still excited and then the gig still went really well but there was this kind of undercurrent of like Remember when No New York came out and they came out with an album called Yes L.A.? And it was huh. kind of like a yeah, yeah. sort of, we were thumbing our nose at New York, and New York right. is too negative, and we have our own bands now. And there was a little bit of that that we were suddenly kind of old school, you know, and they were the new up-and-coming thing. Gotcha. Well, that's, I guess... And that made sense. They They needed to... They have, first they responded against us, and then the, the whole LA scene became completely legitimate on its own, and they didn't need to respond against us anymore. Right. But they had to have some sort of position to make the scene coalesce. Right. And it's interesting how like it, it, everyone against one thing. You know what I mean? East against West. Yeah. It's interesting how like just as groups of people, like it's easy to be get a group of people to be against one thing. Uh, yeah. But it's also equally on the in the rose tinted view, equally to get some of the B four thing too. Um, yeah, that's... and also we got, it got them to, to you know, I think New York inspired them to say like, hey, well, if they can do that, we can do that too. And part of right. that is celebratory, and part of that is like you you have to aspire to one upmanship and and be as good or better than those bands, and using them as a sort of template 
is a good thing, and then uh, thinking like I can even go beyond the template is also a good thing. All that stuff is good. Right. It's it's oh man, but to get the the to get the screamers welcome, that's so sick. <laughs> well, I, w- I wish we were the only people who had it. We weren't that special. They but loved still, everybody. They, Although yeah. Tommy Gear did try to sleep with me, and I turned him down. Oh. <laughs> so I think maybe I was one of the few people that turned him down, or maybe other people did too. He was really good looking. He just wasn't my type. Oh, that's awesome. And you did more work with Kid Congo Powers. Right down the line, you guys had like a band, or you, uh, uh, Congo Kate Nar- had a band called Congo Narvel, and oh, no. I first, we, they, we, it was actually the first time I ever saw them when Joseph Fleury died. They, I think this is it. I get confused because we played more than one benefit, so it, I, you know, and I'm old, I could run the stuff together, but Joseph, we had a benefit or something, or maybe it was when he was sick. I can't remember exactly the, but a whole bunch of people played at this, and we had, a uh, Bleecker Street Incident played, and, Maybe it was when Joseph Flory was sick, and we had a benefit for him. But but Kid came with Sally Norvell, and he had Congo Norvell, and it was literally just Kid and Sally. And they were really crazy, and it was yeah. really beautiful, and they had two or three songs, and I really was admiring them. And Sally had such a beautiful voice and such a, a wild stage presence that was really different than anything I'd ever seen. And then they decided to make the band get a little bit bigger, and uh, they, fortunately for me, they asked me to be part of it. And they asked Jim Sklavunos, who I'd known for years. He used to live in an apartment. He was hanging out with Lydia Lunch for a while. And so I knew him from then. And so he was in that band. And, you know, it was, and Joe Berardi was in it. And, you know, we'd, all these people that ended up being really long, lifelong friends were a part of that thing. And it just, I wish I knew what Mary Mullen was up to now, but that was a, that was a really fantastic band, and it was kind of a tip for the top. And then, but that music to remember him by, it kind of didn't really get a release or something. Yeah. It, for some reason, that album was sort of frozen in release, and so we had gotten these really great gigs opening for you know, Nick Cave or the birthday party or whoever it was at that right. time. I can't remember because I toured with the birthday party once with Lydia. And, but, but then maybe we played with the birthday party with Conor Novell or maybe that was Nick Cave. But we got these fantastic opening slots and got kind of a name for ourselves. And then suddenly it was kind of over. With Were you playing guitar with uh, with Lydia in the birthday party or was that keys? Uh, no, I was playing drums. Oh, okay. Yes, right. you do it all. <laughs> she went you do it to. All. Uh, she had this opportunity to go up and down England, and she was going to uh, open for the birthday party going up one side of England, and open for the Cure coming down the other side of England. So it was right. really kind of a big deal at the time, yeah. and we were both huge fans of both of those bands. And, and but she didn't have a band, and so she just made up a band, uh-huh. and the band was me on drums which I had never really played before That's and awesome. I was terrible but she she was very funny she said just get out there and play something slow and we had Steve Severn from Susie and the Vanties was in it at first and then he quit because his quit he said well I just have to tell you it's too embarrassing and then she had the roadie replace him on yeah. guitar and it was just ridiculous but we had a fantastic time and then she would just, she was Lydia, you know, she would just say whatever was in her head or lie yeah. on the floor and scream or whatever it was. And there's a record out of it that it's kind of remarkable and kind of unbearable at the same time. It's called The Agony is the Ecstasy. <laughs> but I've, I loved playing drums. And she had me be in her blues band after that. Yeah, so on drums as well? That, yes, <laughs> so that so was really weird. fun. Wow. Yeah. That's, when did, like... So the kind of, when did you work with within that? Is that when you worked with Adele Berté, or is that the Contortions? No, that was the Contortions, okay. and then Adele moved to California, and she did a variety of things and had her own bands, and she, you know, she actually was a kind of a commercial tip for the top and had her own solo album out and everything, and then she came uh, for years and years later, like maybe. Th- after all these decades, it's hard to remember the correct date, but it was like five or six years ago she said, why don't we try something together? And so we did, and we were playing around, but we did, we did, the band didn't really coalesce, 
and it didn't happen. But she came over for a while, and you know, she went through my closet and borrowed some of my costumes, <laughs> and we tried some songwriting together, and we saw each other like every day for about eight months or something, and then the band didn't really work out. But I adore her, and she was really funny. And there's, you know, one of the best things is to know someone funny. And right. so, and I'm sort of sorry that didn't work out. It was kind of a tweener project for both of us, and somehow we couldn't figure out what we were doing. Gotcha. Well, when you're in that headspace and you're doing a bunch of different things, trying to see what's going to stick, it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to commit to a thing. And like, yeah. just even as a musician, like, you, you say yes to just about any gig because like every gig you have is temporary. You know what I mean? Like every gig yeah. is gonna either start or stop, or that you know that club closed. Yep, we're not regulars here anymore. Uh, it's it's but it's amazing that everyone is still active and still doing it. Like Adele and Kid Congo Powers and Lydia, all the, all these artists are still doing stuff, and it's so cool and it's important. And um, to kind of wrap it up, I think this this recent re-release of the Mump stuff sounds like like I heard one. I heard the. A, a previous release i forget where um but this one sounds so much more clearer and there's something about the excitement that you guys would have live i think that is on those takes it, it, oh, fantastic. and like I, th I think if anything that carries through through that is like that energy and like the see this live would have been wild and yeah. like well it was really 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 a a wonderful band and Lance you know I've said this before but I thought you know I would say there's three important lead singers in the world David Johansson Lux Interior and Lance Loud <laughs> and you know he's right up there with those guys and to me like that's the peak and he's you know he's wildly different from them but also that's what makes them so wonderful is they're so different from each other and I, I love every single person in the band and you know we we were so privileged, like Ricky Kinster from Orchestra Luna got us Kevin, Duncan Hanna got us Rob Dupre, and Ian North from Milk and Cookies got us Paul Rutner. Like, they're all musicians we really respected when we needed a member that was really going to be in the final lineup. They got them for us, and then we got Joe Katz was an amazing bass player who'd been friends with our friends, the student teacher. We were always so lucky that way. So I'm glad that some of that translates into the recording after all these years. Very much so. That's, that's all. That would have been a bill, the cramps and the mumps. That would have been sick. <laughs> well, if the Swing Madison's got to play with the cramps. Yeah? Oh. <laughs> Locks, man. Ridiculous. What a, yeah, what a crazy act. Like, that guy never stopped throwing himself around. Like, I know. It's so cool. Although the, the, the Dickies, so, you know, uh, oh, my God, what's his name now? I've forgotten the lead singer's name. Yeah. But in any case, I was at the gig where he did, got on top of the uh, PA system, and he fell off and broke his ankle. Oh. <laughs> like, and, and, that, and that was one of the more exciting shows I've ever been to. He actually had to crawl off stage on his stomach Jeez. and pretend he wasn't hurt. And then in that next record cover, the 10 inch where he's in the wheelchair. Yeah. He's really in, that is in a costume. He that's really the... broke his ankle. Ah, that's so punk rock in the best way. <laughs> awesome. Well, Hey, thank you so much for, for chatting with me. It's been an absolute honor diving into your career and, and doing the research and getting to hear all these tunes and getting to talk with you. So I really appreciate this. Well, I appreciate it, too, and thank you for caring about all this stuff, and it was really, and, you know, I think that there's someone there, out there right now that's doing this stuff, and I wish I knew who they were and I could follow them, so we, if you want to remind me about somebody, please feel free. Will do, will do. Awesome. Awesome.